Johnny Bench, who's back here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Johnny? I'm doing great. I, I know it's, uh, and I remember when you were talking about those footballs. I can remember it vividly about those testing when he was right there on your show. It was unbelievable. Yeah. So uh, I mean, we're. I can't. Didn't think I'd talk to Flategate with you, Johnny. But uh, do you have any thoughts on the subject about where where you stand? Who cares? On? Who cares? I mean, you know, it's like the guy threw four touchdown passes in the second half. It doesn't matter what the air is. I mean, if the guy can't catch the ball, he can't catch the ball. Tell the quarterback there ought to be a speed gun on those. And so we're going to talk about fastball. Mm -hmm. But there ought to be a speed gun, and they ought to have a limit as to how hard a quarterback can throw a football. And then we don't have to worry about the air. Did you ever try football, Johnny? I didn't. We, uh, my, uh, the Binger, Oklahoma, had, uh, we had 10 out for the baseball team, 9 out for the basketball team. And uh, a year before we moved to Binger, a uh, kid broke his neck. And so they they uh, they canceled football in Binger. So I no never kidding. Had I was a basketball player. I, I'm proud to say, honorable Mitchell All American in high school. I had a had a, a couple of scholarship offers, so it was kind of fun. But that uh, didn't work out. So then, what was your hoops game looking like, Johnny? How did that look like? Oh, well, I mean, from you know, I averaged 26 in high school, 17 rebounds. It was pretty good. Wow. Of course, you know, they were all you know short as I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you found my coach. We play. We were freshmen. They put us on the high school team so we could, because we were undefeated. And so we uh, had the high school team, and we made the regional finals. And I, my coach says, uh, "I, Johnny, I finally found somebody you can keep up with." Well, I we went into a full court press, and I got him at the baseline, and that's the last time I saw that kid all day. I chased him for four quarters. So I, I said, "This, I don't think this is the game for me." Johnny Bench joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. And before I guess we turn the page on this whole other discussion, then uh, does is it safe to say that you're rooting for Oklahoma just because that's your home state, or do you have another allegiance in the NCAA tournament, Johnny? You know, I, I root for Oklahoma. I was rooting for Cincinnati. I was rooting, rooting for Xavier. I'm sitting here with my son. We're watching the game, and the and the and. Uh, they're, they got the ball out of bounds, what, nine seconds to go? And I said, I'm going to guarantee you right now, he's going down, that guard is going to go down, and he's going to charge, make a foul, and they're going to lose this game. You said that for Xavier you're talking about. Yeah, because I watched him the whole game, out of control, you know, driving under the basket, and they're out of control. I knew he was – that's the only play they had really had to set up was the play that he drove the ball into the center, and then the guards – the, the uh, centers and big men – Mm -hmm. crashed the board and tried to get a tip in. And he went in the court, and the kid made a beautiful play, got in front of him for, yep. the, for the charge, and this baby was over. Ah, Johnny Bench joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. All right, uh, before we get to fastball, let's talk about some of the baseball topics du jour. Uh, unbelievable that child care uh, came uh, to the fore <laughs> for Major League Baseball with what happened with Adam LaRoche. Um, how often was Junior, Ken Griffey Jr., around the, the clubhouse? Based on your recollection, Johnny. Well, I mean, the kids came in after the game. That was that was when they were allowed in there. This is this is uh, baseball. This is something you know. It's our business. It's something out there, and and I think it can make a lot of people uncomfortable when you know kids are hanging around and you're you're talking about some girl that you're dating or something like that. And you you know, it's kind of like you know, it's kind of a sanctity sanctity uh, of just your your own little feelings and everything else where you can just be yourself. And I think there's people that feel uncomfortable with that, and I'm sure. You know, on the side, they were complaining and, and saying, look, uh, my kid wants to come in now. Well, we, we, but we, they all, all of a sudden, now you've got two different locker rooms, one the junior and one the senior. And it just doesn't, to me, it's just, you know, I'm there to play baseball. And I've got to play off, focus all the time. I think there's too many distractions in the clubhouse as there is with all the TVs, with all the things going on. I think, you know, let's just get back to what we're supposed to be doing, paying attention to who we're, you know, who we're going to go up against and focus on the game. That's our, you know, you had, you had all that time before you went to the park. We went there at 4 o'clock, and the kid, you know, the, the players now go to go down to the park at 11.30 or 12 because they've got kitchens in them and everything else. But uh, I just think that uh, when you go down there, if you go down at 4 o'clock and, you know, the kids can come, come to the game, and they, I don't mind them on the, uh, going out on batting practice and doing a few things there when they – do at times with it, but I think permanent is just a little bit of too much of a distraction. Yeah, I mean, uh, have you ever heard of that before, where Adam LaRoche no. had his 14-year-old there for every home game, half the road games? Uh, they had a yeah, locker for him set up. And I, and I love the fact that he loves his kid, and I think it's a, you know, it is, you want your son possibly to grow up and and being in, you know, following your shoes, because they, they would always ask me, do you want your, your boy to grow up and be a major league baseball player? And I said, I'd rather him develop a microchip and be player owner. So, 
um, I think you want your kids kids around, but when when it comes time and you're going into the the workplace, I think it's time to focus just totally on that, and it, it just creates for other players some uncomfortable situations. Well, and again, it does appear that some players did say something to the White Sox management, which is one of the reasons why the general manager or the the vice president uh, Kenny Williams did say something to start to say let's cut this thing down a little bit, and. Um, and it's, the question is, is how can you put this back in the bottle if there are some players who wanted LaRoche to have his kid around and there are some that may have said something behind the scenes? How does Robin Ventura, the manager, put all this together to start playing baseball in a couple of weeks for games that count, Johnny? You know, I, well, I signed my contract. Everybody was always talked about money, and I felt like all the other players on that on our team – that once you sign your contract, your job is to perform on the field. And I, I just think that it would be very wrong if these players didn't take that to heart. If, if they're going to let something influence them that they would not perform on the field, which I don't think will happen, but I just think it's one thing that you have to focus on, and this is my job. This is the, I, these people paid me a lot of money uh, to be out there on the field, and I'm gonna, when I'm going out there, I've got to suck it up right now, do my job, go out there and perform at my very best instead of standing around in the outfield and talking like in a knitting circle talking about, well, we should do this and we should do that. Um, I just I just feel like if you're a professional at all, you shouldn't even have to ask the manager and tell the manager, I'm ready to play for you. Your job is to play. That's why you signed that contract. And without the stipulations, without that, you're going to play the game of baseball and they're going to play as best of your ability. What would you make of Bryce Harper's comments that the game was tired and personalities get tamped down because of the unwritten rules of the game? Johnny Bench, what you make well, of that? that's fine. Bring back the knockdown pitch and they can cheer all they want. Say that. So bring that back and you could cheer yeah, all you go want. Ahead and watch, go ahead and watch fastball and see these guys and Nolan Ryan and talking about this and everything else, you can flip your bat because we had guys do that. There was a couple of times that they would do that or they'd run the bases and they'd do it. And the next time up, they just there was chin music. And if you want to play that, that's fine. I mean, bring back the excitement. Okay, we'll bring back the, the brushback pitch, the knockdown pitch. So it's all part of the more excitement because I know a lot of old-timers and a lot of people for, that watch baseball forever you know, would love to see somebody to have a little chin music. And if you want to do that, fine. Go ahead and just all you want, flip the bat, run around the bases any way you want. But just expect the next time you come up to the plate, you better be watching where you're, how, how much you dig into that batter's box. Yeah, because sometimes you see a pitch that does uh, act as the uh, aforementioned chim music, and it doesn't come close, or somebody's leaning over the plate, then there's stare downs and things of that nature. You see that oh, quite I know. a bit. It, it's comical. I mean, my God, I mean, you're looking at this thing saying, what is he talking about? It wasn't even with him, you know. I'll show you a knockdown pitch. I mean, like Bob Gibson, he'd hit you in the ribs. I mean, okay, fine. The other guys would just go to your head so you could get down. But like you said, if you want to get, if you want to get somebody, you can get them. I remember Ralph Terry, the real old Ralph Terry, that back in the 30s and 40s when he won the batting title. But he was managing the Cardinals, and this kid came out of the bullpen, a young rookie, and he's making like $500 maybe for at, at the most at a month or something like that. And he tells this kid, I want kid, you hit this guy, it's going to cost you $50. Well, the guy comes up and he throws one right at his head. The kid, the guy, the batter ducks, the helmet goes up, the head goes down, it goes right between the helmet and the head. Mm-hmm. And the, while the, the catcher throws the ball back, the pitcher winds up and hits the guy before he can get off the ground. Because you couldn't lose $50. $50 oh, was a lot of money back then. I bet it was. Is this the sort of stuff you're talking about in fastball? This film, what do you talk about? Part of it is, part of it is just it's so intriguing to me because I love speed. I was a pitcher. I was uh, 84 and three lifetime pitching, and so uh, everybody knew I was a catcher. But Mm -hmm. I love speed. I could throw it over 100, and and it it was just something. And then I started worrying about, uh, quite frankly, I'm worried about my health and about concussions. And I've got a a doctor of uh, neurology or uh, the professor of neurology at the University of Cincinnati and the eye doctor and. And uh, his, his position is a professor at the University of Cincinnati, and I went to them, and I started talking about my vision. And so we, we actually have a paper published with the, which is with the National Institute of Health talking about a fastball at 90 miles an hour, and you'll see all this in the film. At four, it has .42 seconds from the time it leaves the pitcher's hand till it crosses home plate. You have .17 seconds reaction time. So we actually trained the University of Cincinnati baseball team in the vision training, 
and able to send the cameras, which are the eyes, the cam brain sees through the cameras, sends the signals to the uh, muscles and nerves, and you react in that 0.17. So you have to identify the speed, the location, and everything else. Well, in the training process, and after we've trained them and starting in January, during the season they raised their average 34 points while the league went down 35. So I've been involved with this, but I'm worried about Alzheimer's or, you know, I got beamed three times, I was in a car wreck. I didn't want, you know, to live in the dark, mm -hmm. you know, in the future. So when the fastball, and I, I, was, I was in love with it. I, I was so intrigued by the fact of Nolan Ryan, Bob Feller, you know, and the way they finally – calculated the actual speed of the ball it was just fascinating and i and i just loved it we see a 101 mile an hour fastball well that's 10 feet from the mound so it's going to slow down obviously some but i just and the talking and the and you know watching nolan ryan and having faced him and you know he was 104 105 i know i mean i i it was just I, you know, one time I said, was that a, a strike? I said, well, it sounded like a strike. I don't know. If sure. <laughs> I assume he was the fastest thrower you ever faced, right? Ever faced, yeah. Ever I didn't, and he, he didn't do much on Randy Johnson, but it was intriguing to know about the, they have heard the legends of Steve Dalkowski and, and know that they wouldn't sit behind home plate in the minor leagues when he pitched because he was so wild that his, this, his fastball was so fast that it would actually go through the wire fence in the back. Back behind the catcher. No kidding. So that, this, this, even, this can be a, get people to sit back there. This it's can always be, intriguing to know. Sure. And we're into it. And now these kids are now six four, six five. They develop their fastballs, and it is really a fastball game, and we fall in love with it. Yeah, and, and I, I look forward to see this narrated by Kevin Costner as well. It, it's this Friday fastball uh, in theaters. Before I let you go, Johnny, I, I'm sorry. I, look, I, I'm a huge fan of yours. I followed your career for, for as long as I can remember. When did you pitch? In high school? Is that when you pitched? Minor leagues? Yeah, I, I started pitching when I was six years old. I lost my first game when I was 16. Had a wicked curve. You wouldn't stand in there on my curveball. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, in fact, I, I almost got into a game. Uh, Dave Bristol almost put me into a game in 1969, uh, uh -huh. and uh, I couldn't have waited. I mean, I used to, I just loved it. It was just such a great game. I think that's why it helped me as a catcher. But when you only have 10 boys out for the baseball team, you know, you, <laughs> and I would pitch, and like I pitched the state finals, but I took infield as a catcher so the scouts could see me throw. There you go. All right, Johnny, this has been awesome. Thanks, Rich. Good show. Thanks. Thank you, Johnny. That means a lot. That's Johnny Bench here on The Rich Eisen Show. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.